When we arrived and alighted the clown car, I asked, is that where we're going? Way up there? I honestly didn't know what I was signing up for. Ross laughed saying, ah, good lad, coming along for the ride without knowing. Yep, Meg chimed in, 300 meters almost straight up. Don't worry, there's a rope at the top for the really steep rocky bit. <laughs> I'm excited, I responded, head cocked, glaring at the massive opening in the mountainside. Hey everyone, I'm Colin McNamara, and welcome to the podcast about my upcoming book, Attempting Local. Attempting Local follows my journey as I explore Ireland, surf the waves of the North Atlantic, hike the country's rugged mountains, and travel throughout Europe, all while striving toward a master's degree. It's an extremely honest account of how tough it can be to leave everything behind and move abroad, though it simultaneously demonstrates the beauty of a life of solo travel. If you're a fan of the podcast and want to show your appreciation, send me a message on Instagram at Cullen Mac. Follow at Attempting Local Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube. And if you're feeling extra sweet, you can become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash Cullen Mac. Anyway, thanks for being a listener, and now, enjoy the show. Episode number 17, Exploring Ireland's Highest Cave. Entry number 17, February 17th, 2019. 175 days since moving to Galway. Entry title, A Short History of Drunkenness. For me, without a good pen, it's nearly impossible to write. I've lost my favorite pen. That's why it's been a couple weeks. Not that a craftsman is useless without his most beloved tool, but the tool is what makes the craft fun. I suppose I'll make do. It's not only the deceased pen that stalled my entries. This semester seems easier mentally, but we have just as many assignments, if not more. Now that it's over, I can say it was more. We had over 36 papers and projects due in 10 weeks. Then, Spencer came to visit last week from Saturday to Thursday. She was one of my coworkers at the YMCA camp, and she became one of my closest friends last summer. I was at first worried about balancing my guide duties with schoolwork, but I'd apparently forgotten how efficient and self-reliant Spencer is. We weaved in and out of each other's days with ease, meeting here for coffee, there for a pint, splitting to satisfy different needs. Because I was sick last week, I seceded my place on the Sunday hike to her. From what I heard, she fared well and was quick to make friends. We walked together to the bus, I informed the hike leaders of the substitution, and she hopped on happily. I left feeling I'd done my job as host. She'd made her own friends and by Monday she was comfortable going out with my housemates while I was ill. She adjusted really quickly to Galway life and I must thank her for that. Not only was there zero stress, but I was sad to see my temporary roommate leave. Though I was happy to get off the floor and back on my spacious double bed. We caught up, swapped jokes, quipped at one another, went out on Donegal Tuesday and took a long stroll to Salt Hill. We sat perched on the diving tower, watching the brave souls swimming in Galway Bay in mid-February. All in all, it was a wonderful visit. Now, on February 17th, it feels as if spring is already on our doorstep, and I'm eager to open up. I've never in my life experienced a winter so mild or so short. In Michigan, the icy season can go deep into March, as deep as the snow we wish to forget by that time. For me though, as the Brexit countdown reaches 40 days, 6 hours, 48 minutes, and 6 seconds, I'm soaking in the rare sunlight. Also, as I type this entry up, Brexit still has not happened. It's June 7th of 2019. The temperature is at least 20 degrees warmer than back home. Birdsong fills the air, and it seems as if their tunes have never been so noticeable in my life. I'm absorbing it all, hoping there's no mad weather shift before the spring is confirmed. Oh, by the way, I finished my fourth book of the year, The Doing of the Thing. It's about the life of legendary boatman Buzz Holmstrom. Again, I'm called west, west to the Colorado, to the mountains, deserts, canyons. But I must stop the dreams. 
for they disrupt reality to too great an extent. So I've started my fifth book, A Short History of Drunkenness. Entry number 18, February 25th, 2019. 183 days since moving to Galway. Entry title, Surfing Round 2. Since Spencer's visit, I've been lucky enough to host another great friend. Shannon used to be one of my bosses at Camp Wataya, and she loves Ireland. She was actually on this side of the pond for the Camp America Fair, the annual pilgrimage to hire international staff. She'd be making stops in England and Poland after drinking some pints of Guinness with me in Galway. And that's exactly what we did. I gave her a tour of the local pubs that I'm getting fairly tired of frequenting. I introduced her to my university friends. She joined me at our weekly mountaineering club social. We caught up, spoke of camp updates, and laughed together, all while hoisting our pints. I had to show her something other than the pub, though. Hey, you're kind of crazy. Want to go surfing tomorrow? I mean, it's a cool story to say you surfed off the coast of Ireland in the middle of winter. Are you serious? She replied. Isn't it a little cold? It's twice as warm as when Max and I did it. Plus, the wetsuits are so warm. Once you're in and moving around, you honestly can't feel a thing. To note, it was still only about 12 degrees Celsius. Alright, man. Shannon gave in. That's on my bucket list, so I'm down. Ah, this sounds so cool. I could tell her hesitation gave way to excitement. She was sold. Awesome, I'll give the guys in La Hinch a call and let you know what they say. I called and we were booked for 11.30 a.m. that Wednesday. Shannon was still slightly nervous, though that was heavily outweighed by her anticipation. Naturally, I enlisted Maxie to help me instruct Shannon. We didn't want her stuck paying for a simple lesson we felt we could give. Shannon then reserved a rental and we were set for our short jaunt south. When Wednesday arrived, the three of us hopped in the little Nissan, which was admittedly an automatic. Shannon didn't take our offer on also teaching her to drive stick. The drive would have been nicer, but the car kept jostling about and quite often pulled to the right. It was noticeable even from the passenger side, and Shannon couldn't control it. The words of Adrian at budget rang in my head. Are you sure you want an automatic? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Going once, going twice. Alright, so be it. Nevertheless, we made it perfectly intact. Stuart from La Hinch Surf School greeted us, cheerful as ever, when we stepped out of our death trap on wheels. Welcome back, guys. Do you want harder softboards this time? Max looked over at me, grinned, and replied, Hardboards for sure. She'll be needing a softboard, though, he gestured to Shannon. Shannon didn't disagree. Hardboards are tougher to balance and successfully ride, especially for beginners. You'll have about two hours, Stuart explained. You're welcome to stay out for a bit longer, but make sure to be back by 2.30 at the absolute latest. That's high tide and the water will be up to the rocks by then. We noted his instruction and suited up. Shannon took the small heated hut and Max and I once again changed out back in the parking lot. We were totally unfazed and more than pleasant because of the higher temperature than the previous outing. I could actually feel my fingers and pulled on the damp wetsuit with relative ease. 12 degrees Celsius and 6 degrees Celsius are a big difference when you're stripped down to your underwear, exposed in a wind-battered car park. All geared up, we grabbed our boards and headed toward the waves. They appeared bigger than last time and sounded like it too. They crashed deafeningly, and mixed with strong winds, we resorted to shouting to one another. Max and I had Shannon lay her board down, and we confidently explained the basics. I kept peering to my side, drawn by the white spray flying off the back of the rolling sea, defiantly clinging to the sky before inevitably returning home. Max concluded giving pointers, and we hurried to the shoreline. I ran with the joy of a child. We clashed with the waves like opposing military units. Once we were far enough out, it became steadfastly apparent how much more technique a hardboard required. My first time out with a softboard only took 30 minutes to catch a wave. 
somewhat more experienced, it took an hour. To make matters more complicated, the waves were significantly larger, and since remain the largest I've seen at La Hinch. And Max and I were trying to split time helping Shannon. Admittedly, he, being a better man than I, dedicated more time to her. While she never got on her feet, she did ride a few waves lying down and eventually on her knees. We reassured her most people didn't get up the first time. Shannon being Shannon, she reassured us she was having a blast regardless of how well she performed. Her unbreakably happy demeanor is truly a joy to be around. We lasted about two hours before heading toward land, Max and I exhausted, Shannon ready for more. She is the human equivalent of the Energizer Bunny. When it was all said and done, I successfully caught only a handful of waves, but they were bigger and quicker than our first go. Max had fared better than I, though even he struggled with the hard board at first. What we'd all struggled with was the undercurrent. The increased force of the waves made it incredibly difficult to get out far. You'd first be smacked in the face by one, sometimes two waves, then your legs would be pulled behind you towards shore as you battled in the opposite direction. It felt like a malignant being grabbed your ankles and wouldn't let go until you excessively wrenched them loose. Despite the fight, we were all in good spirits by the day's conclusion. The three of us shared a meal in a cafe before heading back to Galway, and we reminisced about what had taken place only minutes before. Shannon thanked Max and me for the experience, and she and I had one last pint in Anpukan before the night's end. Shannon left the next day for the rest of her European adventure. It was tough to see another friend leave. Each time it makes my existence here more obvious. They leave, I stay. It used to be so isolating. I should be on that plane with them, heading back stateside. Then I remember my new life here, my new friends. I'm comforted by the fact that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And of course, I appreciate that I'm not actually isolated. How could I be when I've already had five friends visit and there are more who've already booked flights to see me? My friends are my greatest strength, and that holds true even 3,000 miles from home. Entry number 19, February 27th, 2019, 185 days since moving to Galway. Entry title, The Music at the End of the Tunnel. It's tough to beat a pint of Guinness after a hike. It's a mountaineering club tradition. We always either hike over a mountain, come down on the other side, and trek to the pub, or we'll hike back to the bus and the bus takes us to the pub. I believe I even mentioned it in an earlier entry. Alas, it doesn't matter where you hike or even who you're with, club or friends, you'll end up at a pub. I'm currently writing this in Austies, a pub on the west coast of Sligo. We've just come back from Dermot and Grania's cave. It's the highest in Ireland, or so I've been told. I was invited by Meg, a friend from the Mountaineering Club, and her three friends and I squeezed into her stereotypically European car. I was in the back with Ross and Ben because, quote, Ellen gets front seat, unquote. That's what Megan said, hand in the air as if she was abiding by some sacred law. She further elucidated, that's just how it is, so deal with it. The banter didn't stop there. It continued for the extent of the road trip. It was easy to tell I was an interloper in a very close group. The ride was entertaining, though I felt out of place during their sing-alongs which seems so common when getting a lift from young Irish people. Inevitably, I warmed up and attempted to join in on the jokes. My biggest problem is that I'm just not funny. Ask any of my friends, they'll tell you, especially the Irish ones. Their humor is significantly different. They did appreciate the effort nonetheless, and offered me a few pitied laughs. When we arrived and alighted the clown car, I asked, Is that where we're going? Way up there? I honestly didn't know what I was signing up for. Ross laughed saying, ah, good lad, coming along for the ride without knowing. 
Yep, Meg chimed in. 300 meters almost straight up. Don't worry, there's a rope at the top for the really steep rocky bit. Uh, I'm excited, I responded, head cocked, glaring at the massive opening in the mountainside. We began our ascent by 12.40 p.m., and it actually only took us an hour to reach the cave entrance. We crawled upward on all fours most of the way. Every now and then, a gust of wind would push one of us to our sides, and we'd cling to the unstable grass for the illusion of safety. It wasn't until after that I saw pictures of rescue helicopters on scene when someone else had done the same exact hike. Our climb wasn't without excitement, but all five of us managed to pull ourselves up the rope and plunge into the cave's darkness. Once inside, we followed an obvious path to the left. It was tall and wide enough, but it ended in a small opening, which dropped into a seven-foot hole. That hole led to another room. Without enough headlamps and gear, we decided we'd better not attempt the cramped space. We went back around to the mouth of the cave, blinded by the natural light shining in. After only 10 minutes in the bowels of the cave, our eyes had adjusted enough for sunlight to be painful. Meg and I then went over top of the fallen boulders in the main part of the cave. We found another way into the large room that lived further back, going over top and bypassing the small hole mentioned earlier. Meg continued on, I grabbed the others. Ben and I moved toward Meg in the back of the cave while Ross waited for Ellen. The two of us reached a little drop off with a handy rope and scrambled down into, essentially, an auditorium. It was open, large enough to fit a two-story house, and rounded as if we were standing within a globe. Meg was at the very back, simply a beam of light that bobbed and weaved. Hello? Guys? Can you come here please? I've just heard something and I'm afraid of the dark. I don't know why I've come back here alone. Quickly lads, Meg said, her voice noticeably shaken. We moved as fast as the slick rocks allowed. Ben and I heard no sounds when we reached Meg, but we did meet the end of that cave section. We came back out into the auditorium and noticed a slope of crumbled rocks that led to another opening. Ben, Meg, and I scrambled up and peeked through. There was another decently sized room, and at the other end were two small walls, a thin crack separating them, that could be shuffled up. We knew we could get there because there were already wet boot prints leading the way. Ben went up first, and I tossed him my headlamp. Meg went next. That's right Meg, use your knees, just like you know how, Ben slagged. She got herself in a good position and inched up, moving at about a 50 degree angle. I was next, so I handed up her phone and she shined its flashlight back toward me. I could see the route and started moving. You know how we've been joking about how this could be the beginning of a horror movie and how one killer couldn't take on five people? Well, we've already split into two groups, I laughed, continuing my way up. Hey guys, Ben called from ahead. I hear music. My heart sank. I immediately imagined Gregorian chants and some weird heart of a cave sacrificial altar, blood pouring from a freshly dispatched body into various pools, feeding some dormant evil. When I finally got up the slippery incline, I heard that it was just party music. My heart rate slowed to a reasonable pace. Take a look here, it's so bright, it's almost like another natural opening is letting light in, Ben said. Ellen and Ross caught up to us, and everyone started calling out, Hello? The sound echoed through the cave. The only recognition we got was the music stopping. Whoever had gone deeper than us had shut it off. We considered going down the hole, but this one was very deep. We decided with wet boots and without climbing gear, it wasn't smart to take the risk. What's more, it probably wouldn't have been wise to disturb whoever was down there. It didn't seem like they appreciated the attention. We left the cave and per tradition, went to the pub. Alright, if you've made it to the end of this episode, then I definitely know you appreciate listening to my story. Showing that appreciation is really simple and it seriously helps the show grow and reach more listeners. You already heard the spiel at the beginning, so you know how you can help. 
It amazes me that this podcast is reaching people from all over the world. So feel free to reach out wherever you are and share your thoughts on this piece of work, or just to chat. Shoot me a message at Cullen Mac or at Attempting Local Podcast. I absolutely love hearing from you. So thank you again and enjoy listening to Attempting Local, A Year Abroad in Galway, Ireland.